All right, let's open our Bibles, please, to Proverbs 24. Uh, last time I saw this stage was a few weeks ago when they had neighborhood Bible time. I don't know who was here during neighborhood Bible time, but Mr. Domingo was running back and forth and jumping and flipping off of here, and I'm not going to do any of that uh, today. But, uh, yeah, you know, the Lord has just blessed our family tremendously, and we so appreciate uh, God's goodness to us uh, these many years, not just my wife and I and, and our family, but uh, Dad's extended family and, of course, just the great things that God has done through, um, through the sacrifice and the decisions that he made those many years ago. And I uh, really appreciate, you know, God's goodness uh, to us. And, uh, you know, none of us are heroes. Uh, I really mean that. Uh, I told someone yesterday, I said, I've learned in life that you don't call anybody a hero till they're dead. I hate to say that, but uh, too many of us, uh, we're just men, men at the best. Uh, the best of men is still, is still a man at his best, and so we have to be careful not to lift up anybody too much, but it is good to have good examples, and uh, you know, I'm just, my brothers are a great example to me, and especially Eli and Yura. Um, just the faithfulness that they've, uh, you know, just in God's ministry and the, the leadership qualities actually that they've developed, I think far beyond me. You know, they say don't judge a person by his relatives, but uh, for me, it's an honor. It is an honor, and uh, and you you can judge me by my relatives. So uh, I'm really blessed in that way, and that and I mean that it's partly joking, but it's also true. Uh, of course, you'd probably love to hear some stories from our childhood, just to have some blackmail or something, I'm not sure, but I can't think of any right now. Since COVID, I, I literally I lost some of my memory, and so I have to write down a lot more than I used to. But uh, anyway, we, we went to Belarus, my wife and I uh, went to Belarus, we, we married in 1993, and we just celebrated our 30th this year. And we went to Belarus in 1994, and while we were there for the whole summer, God led us to come back to Belarus. And of course, there, it was a very, you know, it was a big time of transition after the Soviet Union basically disintegrated. And we didn't know, of course, at that time if we'd be able to be there a year or five years or ten years, and we never would have dreamed that we could actually be there, you know, this long. Although, I can honestly say we did go with the mindset that, you know, we did go with the idea that if God wants us here our whole lifetimes, that's, that's where we'll waste our lives. And I don't mean waste, I say that facetiously because people have asked us many times, why are you wasting your life here? And uh, so the gifts and abilities and the character and the things that God places in you if you use them for Christ, they're not wasted. And uh, it's just, you know, we're honored to be missionaries. And uh, we're honored to be used of God. And, of course, desire that God would use us to the end, uh, that we would be faithful to the end. Uh, our salvation doesn't depend on it. But, boy, you want to die with a good reputation, a good testimony for Christ. We just experienced that in our family last week. And uh, boy, I, I tell you, I was just, I was so, again, just struck with that thought. You don't want to die, you don't want to pass off of this, this off the scene with a bad name for Christ. You know, it's one thing, all of us are, none of us are perfect. I mean, you can find a lot of mistakes, a lot of things, but you, you don't want to die and bring, and, and have brought dishonor in your life to Christ. You just don't. And so, anyway, I was praying a lot. I have four messages I'd like to preach, but I'll choose one, and, uh, and we'll stick with one. And, and uh, Brother Yura said, you all finish about, uh, I guess, here in about half an hour. So I'll be careful to, to try to stick to the time that you all uh, usually meet. But I, uh, I had this, this thought in my heart for quite some time in Proverbs 24, and uh, so I'd like to start here in Proverbs 24, verse number 30. 
I'll try to stay in English only today. Uh, Proverbs 24 and verse 30. The Bible says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So the idea here is that if you sleep, if you sleep too much without being diligent, he's giving a simple illustration and a, and a simple maybe a life lesson but I'd like for us to take that thought that we see in verse number 32, if you would. Look back at verse 32. The Bible says, Then I saw and considered it well. You look at the lives of people. You look at what other people have done. Now, I'm not saying we should spend our lives doing that. We shouldn't. We preach all the time. Look to Christ. Keep your eyes on the Lord. We shouldn't spend our time just looking. You know, there are people who love scandal. There are people who love nitpicking and love looking and, looking and trying to find things in the lives of other people. And the Lord even points that out when he says that, you know, you hypocrite, you see, you see a, a little sliver of something in your brother's eye, but you don't realize you have a whole log in your own. So you want to be careful that you don't just look at the lives of other people. You don't want to spend all your time doing this. But this is, the picture here is of a man who's walking along and he sees a property that just looks like it was deserted. It looks like it was not taken care of for a very, very, very long time. And so he says, I saw, I considered it well. I, I went home and I thought about it, Right? And then it says, I looked upon it and I received instruction. This word literally is, I, I, I received a lesson from this. And in life, we receive lessons by some of the things that we see. Now, we're to be careful about comparing ourselves to other people, of course. Part of the reason for that, and there are a lot of dangers in that, including that our, our personal growth will be stunted if we constantly compare ourselves to others. People who are underachievers, and I say that, you know, as we say in the world, uh, but if we constantly compare ourselves to people who really aren't trying, who aren't giving effort, then we might feel pretty good about ourselves. And so our personal growth is stunted. But, of course, the biggest danger is maybe pride. We know the, the famous uh, story of the, you know, the, the Pharisee and the publican went in together into the temple. And the Pharisee, he stood in, in front there and lifted up his hands and his voice in prayer. And he said, I'm thankful that I'm not as other men. He was comparing himself in his mind before God, saying, I'm glad I'm not as other men. So we have to be careful in our minds that we don't think, well, I'm glad I'm not like other people. Uh, but on the other hand, the Bible several times mentions the phrase, as others, in a positive way, in the, in the way of giving instruction. For example, in Ephesians 4.17, the Bible said, Paul says, This I say, therefore, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles, in Russian this phrase appears several times in the New Testament, kakprochia. It means as others. It means don't live like the heathen. So there's obviously a comparison here. And he goes on to explain, you're light. You're the children of light. You're to Im imitate the Lord. You're to imitate him in your character, in your tongue, in, the, in your behavior, in your conduct. We're not to live like the heathen, and there ought to be a difference between light and darkness. In ministry, there's constantly a pull to just stay relevant, just be like other people. In Rome, be as the Romans. But listen, if you're light, then you need to live as light. And you need to be separated not only in your walk, but also in your mind, in your heart, unto the Lord. 
It's not a separation of just simply trying to look better or be better than someone else. It's about being uh, living a holy life as unto the Lord. So understanding that, you know, that person could be you. If you look at someone and you look down on them and you say, well, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. No, no, no. We all understand or we should understand that if it was not for the grace of God, that could be me. I've, uh, we, you know, we deal a lot. We see drunks every day, you know, in our ministry in Belarus. Just in normal life, you walk through town and you see people who are inebriated. And, uh, of course, you think, well, you know, I'm glad that God saved me from a life that could have ended that way. Tremendous, tremendous waste. Just unbelievable waste. But there is a profit. My point is that there is a profit in understanding why certain things happen. It's okay to take notice and to receive life lessons from the mistakes or the incorrect way that people have lived and then not to repeat them. So the Bible says in this proverb that he hears, he sees, he smells, he touches, he understands. All of these verbs are sensory, or all of these words are sensory, right? You can... When you read the, the word thorns and nettles, what do you think? It's like we, we used to call them stickers growing up on the farm. Stickers or sticker bushes or thorns. You know, they're, they hurt. You feel it, right? You see it. Here we see this wall is, is just uh, covered with these nettles. And the stone wall is broken down. And so he goes by and he says, you know, I'm going to seriously receive a lesson from that. I don't want to repeat that. I don't want my life to, to be wasted. What's the waste here? Let's describe here what is going on. In the first, first description, we see the description of the place in verse number 30. There are two descriptions. The field of the slothful and the vineyard of the man void of understanding. So, in actuality, in verse number 31, it is the... the Mestimenia, pronoun that covers both of these. And he says, it was all grown over with thorns. It's the same place. The field of the slothful, the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Now, to have property, to have real estate was a big deal. You're a, you're, you're, you, have, you have something with which to reproduce yourself, right? You're not just renting. You are a man that has something. You have property. And so this man has resources. He has the ability to maybe be financially independent. He's able to provide for his loved ones. He has a lot, but unfortunately he sees this place is not used to its full potential. Isn't that sad? You see that his, his, his amazing property is just going to waste. So the person is described in what way? So we saw the place. The person, he describes him in two ways. Slothful and a man void of understanding. So this man is lazy and he is unwise. And you think, well, why are those two connected? Yesterday was Labor Day, right? And uh, on Labor Day, we rest for some reason. We don't labor. Uh, except people whose uh, buses break down, right? And uh, you poor guys had to, had to labor. But uh, the slothful is, the Bible often in Proverbs, we all know, we've all heard the verses, right? Uh, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't roast what he took in hunting, right? It talks about many ways to describe the sluggard or the slothful. This is a person who takes shortcuts. He does the absolute minimum in life to get by. That's the slothful. Now the unwise, this person is unwise because he is wasting his life, wasting his time, wasting his property, wasting his resources. So obviously he's careless. He's less than resourceful. The Bible says, He that is slothful is brother to him that is a great waster. And you wonder, how could a person like this own this amazing property? It's a field and a vineyard. This guy has a lot, but it's just going to waste. Several ways that a person like this 
could own a property. And uh, each of these points could apply to us spiritually. So uh, let's take notice here. One of the ways is that it may have fallen to him by way of inheritance. How many times, you know, the rich, the, the only son of a rich man, how many times throughout history has this happened? Somebody by the sweat of his brow and by working hard, by being diligent, by using his smarts, you know, he sacrificed. He had a lot of stress. He had the sleepless nights. He, uh, he worked hard. And he achieved some measure or even a great measure of success. And then his son comes along and everything goes to pot, as we used to say on the farm. Or it goes downhill, right? Everything just, he loses it all. Or at least it turns into something that is a very, very, very shallow shadow of his former self. Why? Because the young man hadn't done anything to achieve it. It wasn't his burden. It wasn't something that he did. And so, this, uh, you know, it's like easy come, easy go. Well, you know, dad was always rich in his mind. I think that the, that may have been something that the prodigal had in his mind. Dad's got a lot of money. <laughs> I may as well make some of it, use some of it now. I'll come back later and get some more. I don't know. So sometimes when we have this easy come, easy go mentality, we get things easily and we don't value them. Listen, you have a great heritage, some of you. My parents at 13, my, when I was 12 years old, my parents got saved. That was 40 years ago this year. And I am blessed. We're blessed. Our family is blessed. We have a great heritage. But the unfortunate truth is that usually by the second or third or fourth generations, most of that is lost. It's, great, it's very sad, actually. And it's, it, often it's due to, the, to, the, to the, uh, due to the fact that we have gotten it by way of inheritance and we haven't really made it our own. Listen, if you have a godly heritage, make it your own. It's not real till it's personal to you. It's not real till it's personal to your life, your heart. Secondly, he may have purchased it at some time when he had more ambition. You know, he had some energy and he decided to, man, I'm going to make something of myself. He didn't have much character, but he decided he's going to do something. So he goes out and he purchases this property, but eventually his lazy character won out and things went downhill. Maybe that's what happened. Thirdly, he might be old. We don't know. This person may just no longer care. And so he is disillusioned, he's bitter, he's mean, and he leads a pointless existence. How many of you have ever read Sherlock Holmes' uh, Adventures of the Speckled Band? All right. Stoke Moran, you know, do you remember the old man that lived there and he, in the, and he had this swamp adder from India and it's an interesting story. But like this, this man from that story, just he lived a pointless existence and his huge estate was in total ruins. Maybe that's what's happening. Or, thir or the last, as I started at the beginning, it may not be your direct inheritance but it may just have been in the family for generations. This happens to farms in Missouri. In fact, I think Missouri has the, the highest number of personally owned farms per capita in the United States. In other words, they're not owned by corporations. They're handed down by families for generations, 10 generations or more. And so it's just taken for granted. It's just ours and hey, the next guy might do better, and, you know. So he's not really careful. He no longer values why. Because it's taken for granted. And for some, it's not just the second or third generation. Maybe you have, your family has been preachers and whatever else for many more generations than two or three. But when things are taken for granted and we no longer place the value that should be put upon it, then things go 
downhill. Let's look at the property, verse number 31. The Bible says here, And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. All grown over with thorns. Two things. I want to, I'll put the thorns and the nettles together because they're really, they're weeds and they're actively destroying the property, right? The roots go down and they work things loose and, and then you have the stone wall broken down. The thorns and nettles are sometimes mentioned in Scripture. If you would, if you would please open quickly to Matthew 13. All of us are very familiar with the parable of the sower. By the way, I don't know, but I think, I think uh, how many of you remember Karina that was here? She might be watching on live stream. Is this live stream? Okay, so hi, Karina. <laughs> so, Karina and Catherine have the same birthday, 20 years apart. It's just a miracle of God, and we praise God for them. And uh, so anyway, Matthew chapter 13, and the Bible says here in verse number 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Look at verse number 21. Uh, apologies, number 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word in the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Spurgeon has a very interesting message, and I, and I wrote down some thoughts that he mentioned about the thorns in the soil. And listen, this so applies to this concept of what I'm preaching about today. Thorns are natural to the soil. They just grow of their own. You don't have to do anything to, do, to, to have thorns and weeds and, and stickers growing up. Cuckleburrs, we had a lot of cuckleburrs. Spurgeon said, since the fall, evil is not an extraordinary thing, is what we ought to expect in the human heart. Grace, the grace of God, is an exotic, right? Thorns are indigenous. That's, they're right at home there. That's where they come from. They're just in the soil, and it doesn't matter how many. I have a good garden in Belarus. But uh, it doesn't matter how often you weed the garden. You know what? The next rain you have, you're going to have more weeds. It's impossible to totally eradicate thorns and weeds. That's exactly like what's in our human hearts. Listen, there is no way to fully on this side of eternity to eradicate the sin nature. It's there, it's inherent, and thorns are natural to the soil. And he said this, he said, if you want to go to heaven, you must know, believe, and experience some things. To go to hell is easy. Do nothing, right? Do nothing, just neglect. And he said, right things are rare flowers that need cultivation. You know, when you, how many of you have had a garden? You don't have one now, right? because you're here, uh, but you've had a garden. Listen, to have a good garden takes a lot of work, takes a lot of sweat, takes a lot of energy. To have a really good producing garden. Now, we don't really have gardens anymore, right, because we buy stuff at Aldi and we buy stuff at stores. Uh, we don't really depend on what we produce from the soil. But in those days, hey, it was extremely important. It's very, very important. It, mostly society was based on agriculture. And so it was very, very important. And here you have thorns to deal with. Thorns are natural to the soil. They're already established in the soil. They're rooted deep, just like our sin nature. It's rooted deep, right? We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Uh, thorns are bound to grow. There, there's no stopping them. There's no stopping evil in the world. They suck away the nourishment. They suck away the nutrients. And so the idea here is that if so much energy goes into the thorns and the thistles, which mean what? Jesus said it's the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, pleasures of this world. 
things that just suck life out of us. Listen, if we spend all our uh, energies on worldly pursuits, pleasures, priorities, personalities, how much is left for God? How, How much is left for God? What does God get? And so the question is, why waste our lives? Is our life like this man's vineyard where the thorns are growing up? Secondly, go back to Proverbs 31, uh, 24 if you're not there. Proverbs 34, the second part is that is that the stone wall is broken down. The stone wall here was made of stones gathered from that very property. Usually they would go through and they had rocky soil. And every year, whatever stones seemed to come to the top, they'd try to put them into this wall. And the the higher the wall got, the better the protection. And uh, if you didn't have a wall, uh, you know, all kinds of things could, could get in and ruin your crops. A stone wall does not make a vineyard a vineyard. You could have a vineyard without having a stone wall. But it was extremely important to protect the vineyard. You know, the, the rodents, the feral hogs, the wild animals, uh, you know, homeless people, bum. I mean, they had all kinds of people then, too, walking through, travelers, the, often travelers, right? They could come into your property. And so vineyards especially, they were actually guarded. I was, la- uh, last week, I went to visit my uncle, who's still Amish. He has a garden, an orchard, and a vineyard. And it's unbelievable. I've, I've never experienced anything quite like it. He's an amazing horticulturalist. And he, had four, he has 40 kinds of grapes. And he knows everyone. You walk through with him, th- and he reaches up through this netting, and he cuts this one off, and he says, this is what it's used for, and, and it's a little tangy. And he names all the names of it, and he knows every disease that's associated with it. and every. It's amazing. I mean, he knows this vineyard. He knows... He protects it, right? It's an amazing thing. In those days, they actually had stone walls to protect them. That's why in Song of Solomon, he talks about the little foxes that get in, you know, if you remember. The idea here is that standards of conduct, guidelines for personal protection, rules of decency and ethics, and definite boundaries do not make you a Christian. They don't make you a good Christian. And they don't make you a solid Christian. But you can't be a good, solid Christian without some guidelines, some protection, and some definite boundaries. And so the point here is that he looked at this and he saw the stone wall is is broken down. Listen, maybe we need to get rid of some thorns. And we need to build some walls. Not to make us good Christians. But because as Christians, we want to live a godly, holy life. Our Amish relatives all the time, and the last time I've talked to them, they'll say, you know, they they just can't imagine that you would say you're saved because they they believe in hope and you just hope to the end and all that. And, uh, of course, they look at pride in a different way. They think we're prideful for saying we're saved, and we look at them as prideful for saying that you think you're good enough to get to heaven. We, We would never say that I'm... You know, by my own righteousness, I could ever make it, right? But usually they'll say, well, you know, if you were saved, you could just live however you wanted to. And I always to quote to them Titus 2, 11 and 12. The Bible says that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. It's the saving grace of God, right? But the second verse tells us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust." We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. The grace of God that saves also teaches us to deny ungodliness and to live for Christ. Amen? It's a wonderful life because we're in Him. Now, some lessons here and we'll we'll finish. Everything good in life, first of all, takes work and labor. Nothing good just happens. My dad was told last week, said, you know, I'd give anything to have what you have. Nine of us, brothers and sisters, were there. Plus Marilyn, my brother Eli couldn't be there at the funeral. And we all love each other. We're all in independent Baptist churches. 
we are all a little bit different, of course. But we actually love each other. We get along well. You know, we're all Christians. We're, and somebody told him, I'd give anything to have what you have. The truth is, it's not true. He wouldn't. Do you know how many years of foundation it takes to have that? Do you know how many years of sweat, sacrifice, and toil? How much devotion, how much sacrifice, self-denial? Of course, we wouldn't say that to the person, and I wish that they would. But listen, there has a foundation for that. Is that what you desire? In the, tre- in the house of the righteous, there are great treasures. Do you want those treasures? Or do you want your wa- stone walls broken down? Do you want the, the broken up vineyard and the grown over vineyard? Listen, a well-kept growing garden requires constant work. A well-built house requires occasional maintenance to make sure it doesn't fall into disrepair. A successful business requires attention and dedication constantly. That's why most of us in life will never, most of us would, would get a job rather than ever creating a job. Right? Why? We, don't, we want to be able to go to work, leave work, and go home and leave work at work. If you have a small business, it's with you all the time. Now, you try to create boundaries. But the point is, we, we want... If a successful business requires attention, constant dedication, a committed marriage always takes work, self-sacrifice, and wisdom. In all of labor, there's profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth to penury or poverty. Listen, be careful about big talkers, ladies, and maybe young men too, right? Uh, Be careful about people who just talk, talk, talk. Let there, be, let there be a life that's behind that. Listen, none of us should take anything for granted. Don't ever feel that you're entitled to something. So the second lesson here is that spiritual laziness will lead to spiritual ruin. You know, maybe some of us need to have a deep sense of sin, a deep mourning over sin and deep conviction of sin. Root out some of these thorns. The, the, the farmers, they gather these thorns once they've disked them out or, or, or maybe with these, uh, I don't remember what we'd call them, but you, you pull them out by the roots, you try to cultivate out, and you gather them and burn them. Maybe that's what needs to happen. And nothing, thirdly, the third lesson is that nothing can be taken for granted. Don't ever think, because we live in a world where everybody feels entitled to something. It's really, we're not entitled to anything. You have to get off the couch. You have to get up and do something. Listen, there is a connection between wisdom and labor. The resources God gives you, use them. Whatever those resources are, they might be the, of course, the Word of God, the writings of older men and people that have gone before us, uh, maybe examples of strength, your parents, your mentors, your pastors, right? People that have deposited into your lives. So we should seek to develop those things that God has given us. Use those resources, but keep them fresh. Keep them fresh. Never give up. Never, never slow down. If we, all you got to do one year to let your garden get overgrown is to do nothing. Listen, in the Christian life, we don't take a day off, right? Even if you go on vacation, we, we're always Christians. And let's always remember that God is leading us. Let's stand to our, head, uh, let's stand to our feet with the heads bowed and eyes closed. Learn life lessons. Be aware. Observe. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. May we search our hearts and make sure that we're not being overtaken with thorns, the empty pursuits of this world. May we be diligent about the condition of our hearts and lives. Do we exhibit a spirit of entitlement? Do we just take things for granted? Are we willing to labor knowing that we are co-laborers with the Lord? Look, We celebrated Labor Day. Do we labor? 
are we serious about our Christian lives? Have we built up some stone walls? You know, if you want in 30 years to look back and have a committed marriage, a loving family, a fruitful ministry, that doesn't just happen. That doesn't just happen. Let God guide you, but don't be lazy. Be diligent. Father, I pray now that you would bless the preaching of your word. We know that the thorns are so, they are indigenous. They're, the, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Only you could know it, Lord. Now I pray today that you would bless the college, bless the high school. I praise you for the word of God. I thank you, God, for the people that have deposited so much into our lives. And I pray that we would never just waste it, that we wouldn't just leave it behind. But, Lord, that we would value that great heritage. And Lord, I pray today that you would help us to always let another man praise thee, not thine own mouth. Lord, not to desire respect or to be called by certain titles, desire a position, Oh, Lord, in any way ever to seek something that would just uh, lift ourselves up, but that Christ would be glorified. Bless this school. Bless the college. Bless Pastor Mitchell. I pray that uh, the work of your uh, ministry and kingdom would go forward in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen.